Not Chill Audiobooks presents Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, written in 1994 by John Barrett, read by James Ross Spencer. Chapter 7 The Grand Empress of Savannah. An unnatural calm descended over Jones Street after Joe Odom's move to Oglethorpe Avenue. No longer could Joe's sweet serenade be heard floating over the garden walls. In the stillness, it occurred to me that it was time to buy a car. I wanted to see more of the environs of Savannah, but I proceeded carefully in the matter of wheels. Savannians drove fast. They also liked to carry their cocktails with them when they drove. According to the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, more than 8% of Savannah adults were known alcoholics, which may have accounted for the disturbing tendency of motorists to run up over the curb and collide with trees. The trunks of all but one of the 27 oaks that lined the edge of Fort Sight Park on Whitaker Street, for instance, had deep scars at fender levels. One street had been hit so many times, it had a sizable hollow scooped out of its trunk. The hollow was filled with pea-sized crystals of headlight glass that glittered like a bowl of diamonds. The palm trees in the center of Victory Drive had the same sort of scars, and so did the oaks on Albacorn. I had never owned a car. Living in New York, I hadn't needed one. But the idea appealed to me now. If I was going to drive a car in this environment, though, it would have to be a very big and heavy one. It would probably have fins. I'm in the market for an old car, I said to Joe. Something big and roomy. Nothing fancy. An hour later, we stood looking at the 1973 Pontiac Grand Prix. Its metallic gold body was dented and flexed with rust. The windshield was cracked, the vinyl roof was peeling, the hubcaps were missing, and the engine was well into its second hundred thousand miles. But it ran well enough, and it was big. It did not have fins, but its hood was so long it looked like the foredeck of an ocean liner. The man was asking $800. It's perfect, I said. I'll take it. Now, I was completely mobile. I drove south of Gaston Street, breaking Joe's second rule. It took excursions into South Carolina. I sailed past the trees with the scars on them and shared the road with drivers who sit from traveler's cups and lurch from lane to lane. I felt perfectly safe in my rolling metal fortress, rusted and dented as it was. Nothing and no one could get to me, and nothing and no one did, with one very notable exception. Her name was Chablis. When I first laid eyes on her, Chablis was standing by the curb, watching me intently as I parked my car. She had just come out of Dr. Mira Bishop's office across the street from where I lived. Dr. Bishop was a family practitioner. Most of her patients were conservatively dressed black women. Those who gaze happened to meet mine, usually nodded solemnly and moved on, but not Chablis. She was wearing a loose white cotton blouse, jeans, and white tennis sneakers. Her hair was short, and her skin was as smooth as milk chocolate. Her eyes were large and expressive, all the more so because they were staring straight into mine. She had both hands on her hips and a sassy half-smile on her face as if she had been waiting for me. I drew up to the curb and rolled to the stop at her feet. Ooh, child, she said, you are right on time, honey. Her voice crackled, her hoop earrings jangled. I am serious. I cannot tell you. She began moving slowly toward me with an undulating walk. She trailed an index finger sensuously along the fender, feeling the hollow of each and every dent. Yes, child, yes, yes, yes. Yes, she walked on past me and continued all the way around the car, expecting its conditions and laughing. When she got back around to me, she leaned in the window. 
Tell me something, honey, she said. How come a white boy like you is driving an old, broken-down, jive-ass brother's heap like this, if you don't mind me asking? It's my first car, I said. Oh, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. If I did, I'm sorry. I truly am. I did not mean to do that. I just called out, baby. Whatever way I see it, I just called out. No, that's okay, I said. I'm just practicing my driving skills before I go out and buy a Rolls Royce. All right, honey, I can dig it. You're traveling in disguise, baby. You're incognito. Yes, I can dig that, child. I surely can. And you know, honey, when you drive a car like this, you don't get nobody fucking with it. Ain't no stereo for nobody to rip off. Ain't no fine paint job for nobody to scratch up with no key, honey. That's true, too, I said, opening the door to get out. Oh, child, don't you be doing that, she said. Don't you be hauling ass with me standing out here like this. But I live here, I said. That's okay, baby. You can practice your driving skills some more on the way to taking me home, okay? Because Miss Myra Shot is getting ready to kick in, honey. I can feel them. Whew, I'm serious, and these feet are about worn out. There seemed to be no doubt in the young woman's mind that I would take her home. I mumbled something on the order of, well, sure, but it was unnecessary because she was already getting into the car when I did. I live downtown by Crawford Square, she said. It won't take but a few minutes. She settled into the seat and looked at me. Ooh, child, you are some kind of handsome. If my boyfriend wasn't living with me, I would hit on you for sure. I am serious. I like my white boys, and that's what I have plenty of waiting for me at home. Thank goodness. My boyfriend is blonde and beautiful. Hunk for days, honey. He satisfied my every need. We pulled away from the curd. I'm Chablis, she said. Chablis? Well, that's pretty, I said. What's your full name? The Lady Shubley, she said. She turned sideways in the seat, pulling her knees up and leaning back against the door as if she were sinking into the luxurious sofa. It's a stage name, she said. I'm a showgirl. She was beautiful seductively beautiful in a streetwise way. Her big eyes sparkled. Her skin glowed. A broken incisor tooth punctuated her smile and gave her a naughty look. I dance. I do lip sync and I am C. She said, shit like that. My mama got the name Chablis off a wine bottle. She didn't think it up for me though. It was supposed to be for my sister. Mama got pregnant when I was 16, and she wanted a little girl. She was going to name her La Quinta Chablis, but then she had a miscarriage, and I said, Ooh, Chablis, well, that's nice. I like that name. And Mama said, Then take it, baby. Just call yourself Chablis from now on. So ever since then, I've been Chablis. A cool white wine for a cool black girl, I said. Ooh, yes, child. What was your name before that, I asked. Frank, she said. We had stopped for the light at Liberty Street. I looked at the Chablis again, very carefully this time. She had a small feminine frame and delicate hands and arms. She carried herself like a woman. There was nothing masculine about her. Her big, dark eyes were watching me. I told you I could dig Ben in disguise. She said, I'm in disguise 24 hours a day. I am incognito. Wait, so you're really a man? I said, no, no, no. She said, don't you be calling me no man. Uh Uh-huh, honey. Your mama worked too hard to grow her titties. She ain't no man. Chablis unbuttoned her blouse and proudly revealed a medium-sized, perfectly shaped breast. This is real, honey. It ain't silicone. It's what Dr. Bishop's shots do for me. Miss Myra gives me estrogen shots, female hormones every two weeks, and in between I take estrogen pills. They give me breasts and soften my voice. They slow down the growth of hair on my face. They make my body smooth all over. Chablis slid her hand from her breast down to her lap. And my candy shrinks, honey. But I still have it. I ain't having no operation, child. I ain't studying that. 
We were now crossing Liberty Street. Chablis's blouse was still wide open, exposing her breast, not only to me, but to half a dozen pedestrians. I had no idea how far she intended to go, but I feared the worst. I kept one eye on the traffic and the other on her. The back of my neck began to feel warm. You don't have to show me your candy, I said. Not here, I mean. I mean, not now or ever. Chablis laughed. Oh, am I embarrassing you? Am I making you all nervous? Uh, no, not really, I said. Child, don't lie to me. Your face is turning red. She began to button up her blouse. But don't worry, I ain't no stripper. At least now I know you ain't going to be calling me no man. We pulled into Crawford Square, one of the two squares in Savannah that fell within the black section of town of the city's 21 squares. It was one of the smallest and most picturesque. It was surrounded by humble wooden buildings. In its center, instead of a monument or a fountain, there was a small playground. A huge gnarled live oak spread its branches over a small basketball court where several boys were playing. Chablis pointed to a neatly restored four story wooden house on the far side of the square. Yes, child, she said. Miss Mauer's shots are starting to do their thing. I'm feeling that boost of energy. I'm getting that surge of femininity. Got to go and be with my boyfriend. Now, cuz, in a couple of hours, I'm gonna feel like the bitch of all time. That always happens, too. I get to feeling like the last bitch on earth. Until that passes, I cannot stand to be touched. Chablis stepped out of the car. Thank you for being my chauffeur and everything, she said. Oh, my pleasure, I said. You should come and see the show sometime. I put my face on and I get into my gowns. I like to see that. Because right now, you see, I'm just little old Chablis. Just a simple girl. But when I get it together, I turn into the lady Chablis. And I'm good, child. Real good. I'm a beauty queen, you know. I've been crowned in four beauty pageants. I've got titles, lots of them. Right now, you're looking at the Grand Empress of Savannah. That's who you had in your car today. Well, I'm honored, I said. Miss Gay Georgia, too. I won that one also. And Miss Gay Dixieland and Miss Gay World. I've been all of them, honey. I am serious, child. The Grand Empress turned and ascended the steps of her house. As she did, she put an extra measure of swing in her hips and an extra bounce in her stride. It was not until I was halfway home that I realized Chablis had forgotten to tell me where it was she performed her act. If I had put the slightest effort into it, I could have found out. In a town the size of Savannah, there could not have been more than a couple of night spots that featured drag shows. But I let it go. Not that Chablis didn't fascinate me. She haunted me, and she was definitely a she, not a he. I felt no tendency to stumble self-consciously over pronouns in her case. She had removed any trace of masculinity, and in that sexual limbo of hers, she was a disturbing presence, one that challenged all the natural responses. A few weeks later, the telephone rang mid-morning. Ooh, child, am I some kind of mad at you? You ain't come to see my show. Is this Chablis, I said? Well, yes, honey. I just been to Miss Myra for my feminine booster shot. Would you like a ride home, I asked. Well, yes, I guess I done trained you right. I came downstairs and we got into the car. I would have come to see you, I said, but you didn't tell me, honey, where you did your show. I didn't, she said. I'm at Pickup, honey. That's a gay bar on Congress Street. Three nights a week, me and three other girls. You may not be into drag shows, but you'll never know the real Shibli till you see me shake my butt and run my mouth on that stage. And the way things are going, you ain't gonna get the chance if you wait much longer. Why not, I ask. Because I'm fixing to read my boss, and I might even do it during the show tonight. I always say whatever comes into my head, I never know who or what it's going to be about. Anyhow, my boss ain't on the top of my list right now. Him and me is about to have words. 
on the subject of what, I asked. Money. My salary's $250 a week, but I ain't complaining about that because it's for only three nights work. And with tips, it gives me just enough to live on. But I'm the only one that gets a regular salary. The other girls get $12.50 a show, and that's just damn pitiful. Last week, two shows had to be canceled when the DJ didn't show up. And we were standing there with our faces all made up and our gowns sipped in the Boston and give those those girls a dime. Oh, child, he's going to hear from me. And when he does, there's no telling. My ass could be out the door. What will you do then? Make guest appearances? I can get bookings in Atlanta, Jacksonville, Columbia, Mobile, Montgomery, all those places. The South is one, the South is one just big drag show, honey, and they all know the lady. They all know the doll. Chablis looked coyly at me. So if I get my ass fired tonight, child, you're going to have to travel if you want to see me do my shit. Then I guess I better go to the pickup tonight, I said. I guess you better had, honey. Chablis touched my arm and we drew up in front of her house. Look over there, she said. There's something I want to show you. A young blonde man was leaning under the hood of an old car. He was stripped to the waist. His muscular torso was smudged with grease and glistening with perspiration. Two boys sat on the curb watching him work on the car. That's my boyfriend, said Chablis. That's Jeff. He's the hunk I told you about. Come, I want you to meet him. This, then, was the one who, as Chablis had put it, satisfied her every need. It was hard to imagine exactly what those needs might be, harder still to envision what sort of person would satisfy them. Yet, apparently, here he was. By all outward appearances, he was normal, even wholesome. He broke into a broad grin when he saw Chablis. I think the trouble's in the alternator, sugar, he said. He wiped his hands on his pants. I'll get in working somehow, and then we can take a spin. Chablis hooked a finger through his belt and pulled him toward her. She kissed his neck. It's okay if you can't fix it, baby, she said. We got us a new chauffeur and limo. Say hello. Jeff smiled. Hey, he said, extending his hand. You better watch yourself or Chablis is liable to start running your life, too. But I guess worse things could happen to you. He slipped his arms around Chablis' waist. Chablis put her chin on his shoulder and looked into his blue eyes. You ready for lunch, baby, she said. Jeff cupped his hand around her buttocks and squeezed it. I already ate, he said. She leaned into his body. You know you ain't done eating yet, baby. Soon as I get this engine running, I'll come in. I promise. You go ahead. Chablis turned away with a mock pout. My engine's already running, baby, but that's okay. You go play with your car. I'll be having lunch with my new chauffeur. She linked her arm in mine. Come on, child. Keep me company. I was so taken by the situation at this point that I could not muster even a polite refusal. I gave in at once, and in a few moments we were sitting in Chablis' living room having a plate of tuna salad and a glass of Coca-Cola. The apartment was light and airy and comfortably furnished. The front windows looked out through the foliage of a magnificent oak into the square. There were two matador prints on the wall, a shag rug on the floor, and an Aretha Franklin record playing softly on the stereo. From the sofa where she sat, Chablis could look out a side window and see Jeff working on the car in the street below. My baby treats me like a goddess, she said. He leaves little notes all over the house saying how much he loves me, and I tell you, he is such kind of good up under them covers. The man is out to please, honey. He does just that to the doll. Chablis stirred the ice in her coat with her finger. He's straight, you know. He's not gay. He attracts both men and women but he only into women. Of course, my friends say, well, how can he be straight if he goes with you? And I say, as long as I'm getting my fair share, I ain't going to be asking why. She took a sip of her Coke and licked her lips. What sort of men do you attract, I ask?
that depends what's going on with me and my hormone shots. I've gone on them and off them and they make a big difference. When I'm on them, I attract very masculine men, men with girlfriends, men with wives and children. When I go off of them for a while, my masculinity comes back a little and I get to feeling like a tomboy. That's when I attract the gays. Part of me gets excited that usually doesn't. When I'm in my tomboy mood, watch out. Because I can play with everybody, even the nelliest fags. If I think they're cute, I'm going to tease and everything. There are times when I can be really butch. As she said this, Chablis leaned forward and put her elbows on her knees. The cadence in her voice became more clipped and the muscles in her face tightened. She moved her head and shoulders now with the jauntiness of a boxer. For the first time, the boy inside of her came to the surface. But then I go back to Miss Myra, honey, she said, and I get a hormone refill. I become feminine again, and I attract the masculine men. She settled back into the sofa. The lines in her her face softened as I watched, and her body became languid again. The boy vanished. Chablis was Chablis again. She smiled. I don't overdo the hormone, she said. When I get too much of them, I don't climax. So I get off them now and then just to relieve the tension. I don't like to be lifeless down there. I take just enough hormones to give me the feminine glow and keep a chest on me. Chablis went into the bedroom and came back carrying a black dress and a cigar box full of bugle beads. You don't mind if I do a little sewing, do you, honey? She threaded a short string of beads and stitched it to a dress. A girl's got a sparkle. She shook the dress. Hundreds of bugle beads swayed and glittered. She strung some more beads and looked up from the threading. Ever put on a dress, honey? No, I said. Never ever wanted to? No. Well, honey, I never wanted to wear anything else. I've been into women's clothing so long, I have no idea what men's size I am. I'm serious. I gave up on men's clothes when I was 16. I started putting on makeup and wearing little earrings to school and slacks and blouses. For me, it was natural thing to do. I was always a feminine, and I was always called a sissy or a fag or a girl. So I didn't feel I had anything to hide, and I just liked girls' clothes. Well, how did your family take all this? I asked. Well, my father and my mother were divorced when I was five. I grew up with my mother, and I would visit my father up north every summer. He hated the way I was. His whole side of the family hated me. When he died, I went to his funeral in a dress, and I had this gorgeous white boy on my arm. They were appalled, honey. They were horrified, especially my aunt. She started in on me at the funeral in front of everybody, and I told her to get out of my face, or I'd say something about her own son she might not want to hear. So I stayed away from that side of the family, honey. I don't clientele with them clientele? Yeah, I don't have anything to do with them. I don't mess with them. But mom was different, though. She has a big old photograph of me being crowned Miss World, and it's hanging in her living room. She taught me not to worry about things that don't matter. She had a motto that I love. Two tears in a bucket, motherfuck it. That's mama. She's an okay girl. Chablis turned up the sound on Aretha Franklin and held the dress up to herself as she stood before a full-length mirror. She churned her hips in time to the music. The beads bounced. Yes, honey! When the drum rolled, the bugles blew. Flew! Look at them beads, baby. Flawless! She turned toward me again. You sure you never want to put on a dress? Yes, I'm sure, I said. What makes you think I would? Oh, nothing, but you never can tell. That much I've learned, honey. I used to go to straight parties in Atlanta. They pay me a hundred dollars. I'd be announced at the door, you know, as Tina Turner or Donna Summer, and then I'd mix with the guests. Everybody knew I was really a drag queen, but I looked just like Tina or Donna because I'd be wearing a wig. I talk like Chablis, though, and I have a good time, and so 
would they? Anyway, these gorgeous macho men would come up to me and ask for my phone number, and ooh, I go home all excited. And a couple days later, they would call for a date. Well, honey, come to find out, most of them really wanted me to dress them up in pantyhose and walk all over them in high heel shoes. So you never can tell, child. You never know. When I see a gorgeous hunk, honey, I don't assume nothing. More men are into dresses than you think. Us upfront drag queens is just the tip of the iceberg, just the teeniest tip. Do you ever feel like going out in the street in a suit and tie, I ask, just for the hell of it? If I went out without my drag, honey, those rednecks would clock me for the big sissy I am and kick my fucking ass. I am serious, honey. I'd be more paranoid out of drag than in it. But there's something else that does worry me. Here in Savannah, I mean. Know what it is? Walking down the street as a couple with a white boy. That makes me paranoid in Savannah. Don't you ever date blacks? Don't you ever go to the black bars? No, no, no. I don't go up in there, child. That's something your mama don't play. Uh Uh-uh. I don't play up in them black balls, baby. Black boys will hit on you just like that the minute you walk in. They try to make a move on you. Hey, mama, you, and honey, you to death. I don't play that. Black boys are so aggressive, honey. It's nothing for them to come about, stop touching you and hitting on you and stuff, even if you're with somebody. Oh, I know black boys have their points, honey. I had a white roommate in Atlanta once, a real girl, and she loved black men. You know how those white girls get when they get a piece of black dick, honey. Black dick will wear you out. It will make you want to rot all your cheeks. Whew. Chablis stitched a string of beads onto the dress. That's just another reason why I like my white boys, she said. Plus, when black boys find out my tea, honey, they be really to kick my ass. Your tea? Oh, yes, my tea. My thing. My business. What's going on in my life? You mean you dated guys without telling them about yourself? Oh, yes, honey. And what they find out, they either kick my ass or they want to love me. They reach down there to feel something soft and wet, and they feel something else that ain't so soft and ain't so wet. You know what I mean? Then what happens? One black guy put a gun to my head. We partied for hours, and he spent lots of money on me and showed me off to all his friends and everything. And at the end of the night, we went home and was lying in bed just hugging and kissing fully clothed. And he kept wanting to touch me down there. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And he kept saying, why won't you let me touch you down there? And I said, I promise you, you don't want to be touching me down there, child. And we went back to hugging and kissing again. And then he finally caught me off guard and touched me down there. And before I knew it, he pulled a gun and put it in my head. He said, I'll kill you, you son of a fucking bitch. I'll fucking blow your damn brains out. You made a fool of me. I told him nobody knew nothing. I said, you didn't even know. And you were the closet thing to me. So let's just leave it like that. We had a good time, child, and if you're going to blow my brains out, go ahead and blow them out and get it over with and get that gun out of my face because you're scaring me to death. When I made that comment, he laughed, and he said, I'll admit I've had more fun with you than I've had with any bitch. I'm going to let you slide this time, but you better not pull that shit with nobody else or you're going to get hurt. That's why I don't play up in them black balls, honey. I don't need no gun to my head. Well, what do white men do when they find out about your tea, I ask. Jeff didn't know when he first met me. I was in the straight club. I had gone there with a bunch of my girlfriends. One of my roommates was a stripper. She was a real girl, and she would do her strip show, and I would do my drag show, and then we meet and go out to the straight balls and have a good time. I was just sitting at the ball having my cocktail and smoking my cigarette, and I saw Jeff. He was tall and blonde and gorgeous, and he just kept watching me, and I said to myself, no, Shibli, don't even try. Don't mess with this straight man, because this man is too tall. He will wrap you in a knot, girl. 
He sent a drink over and I just nodded and thanked him. Then he came over and we started to talking. He asked me to dance and we danced. My girlfriend saw him and they all wanted to trade boys with me. Later, we all went to my place and sat around and got high all night. Everybody was coupled off just laying on their boyfriends, but there was no sex at all. And when Jeff got ready to leave, he asked for my phone number and I gave it to him. I've forgotten he didn't know because I was carrying on saying Miss Thang and yeah, girl. So it didn't even occur to me he didn't know. He called the next day and asked me to go out. It was so romantic. I bought a new dress and we went to a ballroom that had a live band and afterwards we went back to my place and started kissing and I realized I had to tell him but I decided not to do it till the next night. Well the next night he took me to a basketball game and I ran into one of my old boyfriends. This old boyfriend was the insanely jealous type which is why I had to leave him in the first place. So he started a bunch of shit saying that's a drag queen you're with and that that's how Jeff found out. He was so hurt he just walked off and left me there. I didn't hear from him for a week. Then he called me. He said he wasn't into men. I said, I'm not a man, bitch. Don't call me no man. Then he asked me, well, what do you got between your legs? And I said, that's for me to know and for you to find out. So he said, well, whatever you are, I like you. I can't get you off my mind. And as long as we can be friends, I want to see you again. I said, well, that's fine with me, baby. So he started coming on my jobs and watching me do shows, and he got hooked. After a while, we started having sex, and we became lovers. I even went to see his parents. They live out on the south side. They're Baptists, honey, and they thought I was Jeff's girlfriend, Chris. I had Thanksgiving dinner with them and everything, Christmas too, and they liked me, and I had, and they had no earthly idea. But after a few months, they realized I was not just a passing fling. Their son was really in love with me. That's when they had a problem. I was black. They started watching me very closely. I could feel it. They were looking to catch my ass in the slightest mistake. I really had to be on my guard. Then one time they acted very strangely towards me. They were giving me funny looks, child. I could tell something was wrong. Jeff's mama got me along after dinner. Got, and she said, Chris, let you and me just sit here in the living room and have a little talk, honey. The old girl was nervous as a cat. She said, Chris, there's something I've been wondering about. It's something that I know is very private with you, and I respect your privacy. But my son is involved with you, and I have to know. I want you to answer me truthfully. Well, child, my heart nearly stopped. I looked around just to check out where the door was in case I had to get out of there really fast. Then she said, tell me honesty. Are you pregnant? <laughs> But I was so relieved. For the first time in my life, I didn't have an answer. My mouth dropped open and I grabbed my stomach. When I did that, she screamed and ran out of the room. I just sat there for a while not knowing what to do. I could hear all the kinds of carrying on at the other end of the house. I sat there alone for about 10 minutes. Then Jeff walked in my, with the cutest little grin on his face. He said, okay, sugar, everything's fine. Let's go. When we got outside, he was still grinning, and I said, What the hell was going on in there? For a minute, I thought your mama found out my, about my tea. Jeff put his arm around me. Whatever you said, baby, you said it right. Look what we got, child. He pulled out the biggest wad of money I ever saw. He had eight $100 bills. It's from dad, he said, to pay for your abortion. <laughs> Chablis clapped her hands. I took that money them white folks gave us to murder their unborn grandchild, and I bought that color TV sitting over there. <laughs> and that video cassette player, too. And with what I was left over, I went out and I got the raunchiest little sequin dress I could find. So in case they ever do find out who I am, I can shake my ass in their face and tell them, thanks from the bottom of our interracial baby's dead little heart. Chablis got up and went over to the window. Ain't you finished yet, honey? She called. Jeff looked up from the street below. He was standing in front of the car. The two boys sat in the front seat, gunning the engine. He made a V sign. Be there in a second, he said. 
Chablis turned back from the window. Yes, child, that abortion was some kind of good. I told with the idea of taking just folk to court for attempting fucking murder, if you know what I mean, to pay them something spiked, honey, that, that attempted murder, ain't it? <laughs> Could be, I said, under the right circumstances. Well, I didn't do it because I didn't want to hurt Jeff and also because I wasn't finished with them two motherfuckers. No baby. Six months later, we went back and convinced them I was pregnant all over again. That got us another 800 which paid for a few more gowns and a flawless weekend up in Charleston. But that's got to be the last of it. If we try again, it will dawn on them that it would be cheaper just to pay somebody to shoot me and throw me off the Dalmash Bridge. <laughs> Chablis put the dress aside and closed the cover on the bugle bead box. I don't see my in-laws anymore, but Jeff and me are closer than ever. Someday he'll go back to wanting girls, but I'm prepared for that. I just don't want him to leave me and go to a guy. I want him to go back to girls. If he does go to a guy, I feel awful bad. I dated one guy, and when we broke up, he started going with men. That hurt me so bad, and he couldn't understand why. I tried to tell him, I'm a woman. Treat me that way. It's the way I treat myself. I want a man who wants a woman, not a man who wants a man. Jeff appeared in the doorway. Well, thank goodness, Chablis said. I was getting tired of waiting on you. Another minute I was going to start hitting on my new chauffeur. And I'm some kind of ready for you, baby. Jeff lifted one of her feet and removed her sandal. She lay back on the sofa. Because Miss Myra's shots are starting to kick in. Honey, she said softly. He massaged her bare back and stared into her eyes. Mmm, yes, baby, she said. I got up quietly and took my leave. As I closed the door behind me, I could hear Chablis murmuring, Yes, child, yes, baby, mmm. The pickup occupied a loft building on Congress Street. I could hear the thump, thump, thump of disco music as I approached the club's front door. Inside, a short-haired woman wearing jeans and a work shirt sat on a stool chatting with a uniformed policeman. A handwritten sign on the wall read, $15 membership fee, but she waved me in without taking any money. The ground floor had a long, dimly lit bar and a dance floor with flashing lights and booming music. The place was crowded with young men in casual attire, but for the most part, conservative. A poster by the entrance announced the featured appearance of the Lady Chablis for two shows at 11 o'clock and 1. The $3 admission charge was collected by a thin man who wore a baseball cap over his stringy waist-length hair. The overture's already started, he said. The room upstairs was a narrow, low-ceiling space with a bar at one end and a small stage and runway at the other. A revolving mirror ball hung from the ceiling. About 50 people, including a number of couples, were taking their seats amidst the dim of the recorded overture. A scratchy, fast-paced medley of Broadway tunes played at extremely high volume in order to drown out the disco beat from downstairs. As the overture ended, the room went black. The beat shifted to the pulsating rhythms of Natalie Cole's jump start. A spotlight hovered over the stage and then ditch. Chablis suddenly burst into view, looking like raging fire in a skimpy sequin dress with jagged red, yellow, and orange flame-like fringe hanging from it. She wore huge earrings and a wig of long black curls. The audience cheered as she strutted down the runway, working every nuance of the rhythm, shaking her behind like a pom-pom. Whipping it from side to side, she looked over her shoulder with an expression of supreme sassiness. She was a minx, a temptress. She danced superbly, mouthed the words to the song, and smiling as if tasting something delicious. The look in her eyes were lighthearted and outrageous. It seemed to say, if you thought that last bump was vulgar, honey, watch this one. 
One by one, her fans rose out of the audience and moved to the edge of the runway. They held out dollar bills folded lengthwise. Chablis accepted their offerings without missing a beat, taking the money in her hands or allowing them the campy pleasure of slipping it into her cleavage. As the song came to an end, she excited and exited to the cheers and whistles and stomping feet. In a moment, Chablis' crackling voice came over the loudspeaker. Hey, bitches, she said. Members of the audience called back. Hey, bitch. Chablis returned to the stage carrying a microphone in her hand. She was dabbing perspiration from her neck and chest. Ooh, child, I am sweating, honey. I truly am, and I am not ashamed of it either. I want all you white folks to see how hard I'm working for you. She wriggled as the audience cheered. I need another napkin, honey. Whew, who's going to give me one? Whoever gives me a napkin wins a prize. And I ain't saying what that prize is until you win it. A napkin was handed up from the audience. Thank you, baby. You're a true gentleman. Yes, you are, honey. I'm serious. And you win the prize. You get to eat my pussy for the rest of my life, okay? The audience howled. Yes, honey. I am sweating, but I'm going to have to slow down soon. If I don't, the doctor says I'm going to have to meet another miscarriage. Yes, honey, I'm with child again. My due date is getting closer and my youngin' is dropping lower and lower. It's tough dancing in this heat when you're pregnant. You know, have you ever tried it? Try getting pregnant like me and then come up here and dance, honey. Ooh, child, you'll be worn out. Are my feet swelling? Can you see them? Are they swelling, honey? You know how your mama did when she was pregnant with you. Do my feet look that way? The audience cried out, no. Well, I hope not, child, because your mama had some ugly feet when she was carrying you. Hoots and whistles from the audience. Just kidding, she said. I got a business deal to offer all you white boys. My husband's folks won't pay for no more abortions, and we're getting hard up for the cash. Take me home to meet your mama and daddy and tell them I am pregnant with your baby and see how fast they come up with the money. I'll split it with you 50-50. You don't think they do that? Guess it again, honey. My husband's daddy is a Baptist minister and he paid for it thrice already. That's mass murder, child. I am serious. Chablis walked farther out toward the end of the runway, but after a few steps, the microphone cord snagged and stopped her short. She tugged at it, but it would not go any further. She turned toward the DJ's booth. Michael, Miss Thang, she tugged again. Miss Thang, you ain't fixed this cord yet? She looked at her audience. Now, I ask you, would you think Bert, the man that owns this damn club, would fix this cord so I could come all the way to the end of the stage closer to you? So I could touch you? So you could get those extra vibes? A chorus of scattered jays came from the audience. If you all can't do better than that, you can take your damn tired asses on home. I am serious. Now let me hear you holler, yeah, bitch. Yeah, bitch. That's better. Yes, child. Now I can feel your presence. Chablis ran her hand down the side of her dress and shimmied. Yes, I can feel you are here, child, even if I can't reach out and touch you the way I usually do and would do right now if it weren't for this motherfucking sorry ass cord. Whistles and capped calls. Maybe Bert thinks I'll break down and get it fixed myself. Do you think I should? Do you? No way, baby. I ain't giving up my coins for no cord, honey. Your mama's going to be shopping for gowns. Give me any length of cord you got and I will play with her. Yes, girl. Long or short, I will play with your cord. Whatever size it is, honey. Because your mama got started acting like the heterosexual pregnant white woman she and her keep her fucking money in her pocket. The audience cheered. Chablis undulated in places. Just kidding, honey. She purred. Okay, gang, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. And if I offended anyone, two tears in a bucket, honey? Motherfucker. Yes, child, we have a wonderful show lined up for you. We have a whole bevy of beautiful bitches. So I want you to put your hands together now and welcome to the stage the... Chablis looked down at a man and a woman sitting at the table by the edge of the runway. 
You two have been necking and carrying on all through my number. No, 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 that's all right, baby. I don't mind. Get it while you can, honey. But tell me something, girl. Is he your husband or your boyfriend? He is? Well, I think I should tell you him and me has been fucking since Christmas time. Yes, honey, he is the father of my baby. That's right, child. Where you from? Hilton Head. And what does the father of my baby do besides fuck real good? A lawyer. Ooh, my youngin's gonna have a rich daddy when you become a lawyer, honey. You get to have all that stuff after your name, don't you? Like Esquire, an attorney at law. I don't need nobody telling me about Lois, child. You get messed up with Reefa and the cops, honey, and you're going to know Esquires and attorneys at law. You're going to know Lois, but your wife don't get none of that shit after her name, does she? She just gets to carry the baby, huh? Well, let me tell you something, child. I get applause, honey, and people yelling, Hey, bitch! Chablis slinked along the runway at the audience, shared, Hey, bitch! And I get something even better than coming after my ass, she said. I get some fine stuff coming after my ass, child. I bet all you bitches wish you did too, don't ya? Chablis looked into the spotlight. Miss Thang, shine the light over there. Chablis pointed in my direction, and in a moment I was blinded by the spotlight. I want you all to meet my new chauffeur, she said. Ooh, yes, child, my new white chauffeur, honey. He drives your mama's black ass all over Savannah. Soon as he learns how to drive a little Royce, that's right, nothing too good for the lady. I am serious, nothing's too good for the doll. Okay, Miss Thing, that's enough with the light. Bring the light back to mama. Well, thanks, honey. Now I want you all to enjoy the show. Have a good time. And don't let me catch you, none of you bitches, laying a hand on my new chauffeur. Because if I catch you, child, you will have to deal with Chablis. Yeah, you'll deal with me. That's right, honey. Me and my fucking ice pick. Chablis turned and undulated back up the runway. When she reached the curtain, she looked back over her shoulder and whispered into the microphone. Oh, just kidding, honey. Chablis was followed by Julie Ray Carpenter, who was a foot taller and at least 80 pounds heavier. A curly-headed blonde, Julie Ray had a dimple smile and wore a bright blue ill-fitted taffeta dress that you could tell from the puckering stitches was homemade. She skipped and bounced and twice flung herself spread eagle again the back wall for dramatic effect, but she did it without a hint of irony and without a clue of how embarrassing it was to watch her. About a dozen members of the audience gave Julie Ray tips. An equal number got up and left. As I sat watching her, a waiter in a floppy straw hat tapped me on the knee. Chablis asked me to bring you backstage, he said. He led me across to a cramped dressing room shared by all the members of the show. They were adjusting their hair and makeup at a long dressing table. Chablis was wearing only pantyhose. She caught my reflection in the mirror. Hey, honey, she said, I hope you ain't mad at me after what I just done to you on there, shining that light in your face and talking dirty and all. We're still friends, I said. Oh, that's good, honey, but I guess that lawyer from Hilton Head won't be coming back soon. I was watching him the whole time talking and necking with his fish while I was doing my number. And, honey, I will not take that. Lucky for him, he backed down when I got into his shit about it. Because if he hadn't, I would have got Mina. Chablis removed her wig and combed her natural hair into a pompadour. I got as far as taking off my shoe and hit people over the head to prove to them that, you know, don't let this dress fool you. Last weekend in Valdosta, a girl was talking real loud, and when I started in on her, she threw a beer at me. She was one of those real mean lesbians, honey. She was a pit bull duck. But what she failed to realize was that there was a whole pitcher of beer sitting on her table. I baptized the bitch, honey. I baptized that bitch. Well, how did your boss like being called a cheapskate, I asked. Child, that was nothing. I let him off easy, because I remember my pay envelope was downstairs at the bar. I was afraid he might not let me have it if I was too rough on him. I'll get him later, though. 
Julie Ray came off the stage and was followed by Stacy Brown, a tall, elegant black. Next up was Don Dupree, a statuesque blonde with long, straight hair and a very modish clothes. Chablis told me Don was a professional seamstress. She made the dress I just wore, she said. Did you like it? Oh, very impressive, I said. It was perfect for my slut routine, but I'm doing something different for my second song. Something just for you, honey. Something very demure. I'm going to do my uptight pussy debutante number in a floor-length cab. I wear pearls, too, but I ain't that pure. Could have had lots of rhinestones instead. The dress had a slit up the back, too all the way up to my ass, but I'm going to move real slow and sedate, being the lady that I am. Slow dancers are good for business. They make it easier for me and my fans to come up and give me tips, and when you dance fast and dirty, it intimidates some of them, and it's hard for them to get to you while you're jumping around. Fact. I gotta put that girl on quick. It's almost my turn. Chablis riffled through a long rack of dresses. This is my drag, honey, she said. The rack held 50 or 60 dresses in a rainbow of colors, most of them sparkling with sequins and rhinestones. There were fluffs of marabou, ripples of velvet and satin, and clouds of tulle. She held out a red strapless gown. This is the dress I won Miss World in, she said. She pointed to a blue one. And this one was my Miss George address. If you ever pass a dress shop and want to be nice to the doll, honey, just remember I'm a lady small size six. Chablis stood virtually nude. Her torso was an ideal woman shape, narrow shoulder, full-breasted. Her hips were a bit on the slender side, but I noticed there was no bulges in her pantyhose. Ooh, baby, she said, I just clocked you checking out my pussy. You didn't see nothing, I hope. Nothing at all, I said. Well, good, because if you ever see anything in my panties, child, you tell me. You say, girl, your cotex is showing, and I will shift her, honey, because I just cannot take that. This is an ugly sight. That is just a nasty-looking thing, honey, to be out there all painted with your dick showing. Julie Ray looked up from her makeup. Really, Chablis, she said. Well, that's what I wear a gaff, Chablis went on. What's a gaff? I asked. Chablis looked at me with genuine surprise. You never heard of a gaff? No, what is it? A gaff is a girl's best friend, she said. It holds her dick in a place. Chablis, Julie Ray blurted out through a mouthful of bobby pins. Sister hates it when I talk this way. Don't you, Miss Thang? Julie Ray did not answer. She was piling her blonde curls into a Gibson girl upsweep. Chablis turned back to me. It's a trade secret, honey, and Miss Thang thinks I spoil the illusion when I talk about us girls having dicks and all. Chablis picked up a small rectangle of pink cloth with two narrow elastic loops attached to it. This is a gaff, honey. It's something like a G-string. What you do is first you pull your stuff back between your legs, and then you step into the gaff and pull it all the way up. You shove your ovaries up inside you, too. I call my testicles my ovaries, honey. Chablis looked wide-eyed at me. Child, you should see the look on your face. I can't think of anything more painful than what you just described. Ow! I said. Then don't let me tell you what we do with duct tape. Chablis did not wait for me to stop her. Duct tape is for when you want to be butt naked. You tape your stuff back inside the crack of your ass, honey, and nobody knows the difference. But you talk about pain. She is a painful girl to pull off, and getting a hard on in that position ain't no picnic either. Julie Ray slammed her hairbrush down and left the dressing room. There goes Miss Thang and all in a huff, said Chablis. She'll get over it, though. She's a good girl, and I love her, and she knows it. And she's right anyway. This bullshit ain't as easy as it looks. It takes me 20 whole minutes just to do a daytime face, eye, shadow, eyeliner, mascara, and it takes an hour to get ready for the show. Julie Ray came back into the dressing room. Chablis gave her a rueful look. Okay, Miss Thang, she said. I'm through talking that shit. 
I ain't giving away no more secrets. I'm sorry I did it. Yes, I'm sorry, baby. All the way down to my real live pussy. Do you forgive me? Julie Ray smiled in spite of herself. Good, honey, said Chablis, because us girls had got to stick together. Ooh, child, there's my cue. Chablis took a midnight blue evening gown off a hanger and slipped into it. The dress was high-necked and hung straight to the floor. A solid cape of rhinestone sparkled across her shoulder. Sit me, honey, she said. I zipped her. There were indeed a slit halfway up the back, but the song was a slow-moving ballad, and Chablis swayed sinuously rather than bumped. She used her shoulders to express the mood and the emotions of the song, and her fans stood in a line to give her tips. When it was over, Chablis took the microphone again to thank the audience for coming. If you like the show, she said, thank you from the bottom of my heart, and just remember my name, the Lady Chablis. If you did not like the show, honey, my name is Nancy Reagan, and go fuck yourself. Chablis came backstage and took off the long gown. My lawyer from Hilton Head learned his lesson, she said. He tipped me $20. She put on a lime green silk mini dress with tears of swaying beads. Now it's time to go downstairs to the bar, pick up my money, and have an apple schnapps and a cigarette. She applied some lipsticks. Then I'll come back up for my second show, get into one of my nastiest bump dresses, and ream Bert's stinging ass from here to kingdom come. Downstairs, the disco music was deafening. I followed in Chablis' wake as she made her way through the crowd to the bar. She greeted her fans as they approached, turned her head so they could kiss her on her neck and not smudge her makeup or moose her hair. What's, honey, she said. You missed the show. That's okay. You can take that tip you was going to give me and stuff it in your bosom right now. There you go. Ooh, child. Thank you, honey. Hey, baby. How you doing? Okay, girl. This just looks good. Oh, child, you still got that number you was here with last week? Yeah. Tell me quick. Pull the tea, girl. Pull the tea. All right. No, honey, I did not bring my husband with me tonight. He's waiting on me at home, saving his big old heart on just for me. By the time Chablis reached the bar, her apple schnapps was waiting. She took it and raised her glass to the squat, thick-shouldered man standing next to her. Hey, Bert, she said, two tears in a bucket. She downed the drink. Bert had a shiny bald head and sad eyes. How you doing, Chablis, he asked. Well, I ain't on food stamps yet, she said, but I'm getting real close. It's a good thing you all done pay me any more than you do, or I might never qualify. Bert did not answer. Speaking of which, she said daintily, holding her hand, may I have the envelope, please? Bert gave her a small envelope. Well, thank you, honey, she said. You coming up to see the second show? Yes, I guess so, Bert said. That's good, because I always do a better show after I've had my apple schnapps. And honey, you don't want to miss the second show tonight. Chablis looked inside the envelope. Uh, where's the rest of it, she said. The rest of what, said Bert. Uh, my money, I'm a hundred dollars short. You've been taking money out for my pay. Oh, well, yes, Bert said. That was because of the two shows you didn't work. We didn't pay you for those. A flash of anger sparkled in Chablis' eye. Bert, that's a bunch of shit, she said. What do you mean, said Bert? Maybe I wasn't in front of that spotlight, but I was in front of my makeup mirror, and that works right there. Then I caught a cab to come down here, and I got here on time. No one even called me to tell me the shows were canceled. I get a salary. That's our agreement. Bert gave Chablis a worried look. If you don't work, Chablis, you don't get paid. That's the way it is. Bert, my rent is due. God damn it. How am I going to pay my rent? You'll have to talk to Marilyn, said Bert. Marilyn was Bert's wife. I ain't talking to nobody. I want my money. Bert sighed. Chablis, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm tired. Fair is fair. Chablis slammed her hand down on the bar. Then fuck it, she said. Watch that. She turned and cut quickly through the crowd, pausing briefly for a whispered conference with Julie Ray. Then she charged up the stairs with Bert in close pursuit. Chablis, Bert called after her. What are you doing? Give me my money, she demanded. But you didn't work. Yes, I did. In the dressing room, Chablis grabbed a handful of dresses off the rack. I'm taking my drag show, she said. I am quitting. 
Chablis, please don't, said Bert. He took hold of the dresses, and for a moment the two of them were locked in a tug of war. Don't you go pulling my bead, child, said Chablis. Bert suddenly embarrassed let go. Jewel Ray appeared in the doorway behind Bert. She was accompanied by a half dozen people she had brought up from downstairs. Chablis tossed the dresses over Bert's head. Julie Ray caught them and handed them out to the people in the hall. Keep them coming, Chablis, she said. We're with you, babe. Chablis took another handful of dresses from the rack, but this time Bert raised his arm to block her way. Chablis, he said, you're forgetting something. You borrowed a hundred dollars from us six weeks ago, and you have never paid us back. Chablis paused for a moment. Oh, that's true, she said, but you never gave me a deadline. You could have warned me you were going to cut my pay, especially when my rent was due, and somebody could have called to tell me the shows were canceled. I could have got booking somewhere else. I could have went to Columbia. The tips in Columbia are flawless. Well, I'm sorry, Chablis, she said, Bert, but I can't let you take anything out of here until you pay back the loan. Chablis thrust a silver lame dress at Bert. Here, she said, take this dress. It's worth a hundred dollars and it'll make you even. Now I'm hauling my shit out of here. Bert started blankly and stared at the dress. It was a piece of silver cloth no bigger than a tea towel. It hung limp in his hand. What am I supposed to do with this, he said. Wear it, said Chablis, and here's a little something else. In case you'll want to hide your dick while you got it on. She shoved a gaff into Bert's face. Julie Ray squealed with delight. Bert dropped the gaff with a look of disgust. Chablis, he said, the trouble with you is... Don't start, said Chablis, because I know what the trouble with me is. The trouble with me is I buy a whole wardrobe of gowns, and then I spend hundreds of hours sewing on beads and sequins and rhinestones, and I don't get paid for any of that. I buy records so I can learn new songs, and I get hormone shots for $20 twice a month month to maintain my feminine image, and nobody pays me for that either. Then I spend hours fixing my hair and making my face and getting me into my drag so I can come down to this filthy pisshole of a place that looks like somebody's attic and do my best to create an illusion of glamour. Honey, the rafters in here are so low, I'd be afraid to come out on that stage wearing a tiara. Chablis glared at Bert, her dark eyes blazing. Well, Chablis, he said, if you... The trouble with me is I work for a man who thinks he's doing me a favor by letting me parade around on the stage. He thinks I have so much fun putting on dresses and shaking my butt that I don't care if I get paid or not. Well, let me tell you something. There are times I don't feel like putting on a dress or making my face, but I come down here and I do it anyway because it's my job. It's how I make my living. And I'll tell you something else. It's damn hard work being a girl full time. Chablis said Bert. You're not being fair. You know I think of you as family. Chablis sighed. She had one hand on her hip and a sardonic smile on her face. Sure, baby, she said softly. I suppose that's why you got that sign down by the front door that says $15 membership fee. The fee that only black folks are asked to pay. Because black folks are not welcome in this club as guests. Only as the hired help. The hired help that don't always get paid. Chablis took another handful of dresses off the rack. Stand back, bitches, she said. This member of the family is leaving home. The hall outside the dressing room was now crowded. Chablis tossed out gown after gown. Hold him up high, honey. Don't drag the drag. Hold him up over your head, baby. When the rack was emptied, Chablis turned to Bert. He was still holding the silver lame dress. Don't forget your gaff, Bert, she said. You're going to need it to hide your dick when you wear that dress. Bert said nothing. Chablis shrugged. Suit yourself, she said. But when the time comes and you ain't got a gaff to wear, what you going to do, huh? I'll let you in on a little trade secret. There's something else that works just as good as a gaff. Put it on four pairs of pantyhose. Do that, honey, and everyone swear you got a pussy. 
Chablis tossed the last dress to Julie Ray. Okay, Miss Thang, she said. I am ready. Then down the stairs she went, followed by a cascade of glitter and fluff. Chablis strutted out onto the dance floor, her long train of gowns floating behind her like a colorful twinkled Chinese dragon. Other dancers joined the line, raising their arms to support the windy canopy of dresses. Chablis was radiant. Child, she called out. I wish my mama could see me now. She bumped and wiggled and shook her butt. The gown bearers fell into step behind her, hooting and hollering as Chablis led them snaking around the dance floor into the bar, down its entire length, past the man with the baseball cap and the stringy hair, past the sign that read $15 membership fee, and out into Conger Street. She turned and headed east, still dangling to the music, her long train flowing out behind her. The street lights glittered off the rhinestones and the sequins, igniting sparks of lights in the billowing of peach, red, and green, and white. It's like I told you, honey, she called out as she passed me. You're going to have to travel if you want to see me do my shit from now on. Macon, Augusta, Atlanta. Columbia. They know the doll, honey. They all know Chablis. Traffic on Congress Street slowed to a crawl in order to take in the glittering procession. The air was filled with honks and whistles and shouts in a mixture of good nature, cheer, and lusty derision. The motorists were unaware, of course, that the spectacle they were witnessing was that of the Grand Empress of Savannah parading every wig, gown, and gaff in her impartial imperial wardrobe. Chablis waved to her subjects. Sisters moving out, she shouted. Yes, honey, mama's on the mood. I am serious, child.